Okay, thank you all for being here, and uh, thank you for that welcome. Uh, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists. First of all, uh, next to me is Akil Biltaji, who is the Vice Chairman of Royal J Jordanian Airlines, and I highly recommend, if you haven't seen their advertisements, Trolling America and other places, I think you should definitely uh, check those out, uh, particularly on Twitter. Uh, Akil was formerly the, until March this year, was the mayor of the Greater Amman Municipality in Jordan, uh, and he is himself a former refugee, so I think that's uh, important to note. Uh, next to him is uh, Claudia Gonzalez Ramos, who is the Special Advisor and Global Chief of Public Advocacy for UNICEF. She was previously uh, working in the Executive Office of the Secretary General of the UN. Uh, leading communications for the special advisor, and uh, she has many other distinguished titles. Uh, next to her is Henry Cisneros, who is the chairman of City View in San Antonio. He's also the vice chair of Habitat for Humanity, and in 1981, he became the first Hispanic American mayor of a major U.S. city, uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, he was also the former uh, secretary for housing and urban development under President Clinton. And last but not least is uh, Khalid Kossa, who's the Executive Director of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund in Geneva. Uh, I won't go through all of his uh, non-resident fellow titles, but there are about eight of them, which I'm very impressed by. So uh, yeah, a, a traveling academic, a peripatetic academic. So uh, today we're going to have, um, I think, a fascinating discussion. We're talking about uh, the issue of migration and refugees. Uh, we're talking about it particularly in the context of cities, um, but necessarily we'll have to talk about the broad overview as well. Uh, there are over 65 million refugees in the world today, uh, if you include asylum seekers, internally displaced people, but only around 105,000 of UN-assessed refugees are resettled each year. So a uh, serious problem, and we want to explore how cities, global cities, can help us to resolve this issue. Uh, a number, and um, my panelists can probably correct me if I'm getting it wrong, but from memory, the average refugee in the world today spends about 23 years before they're resettled. So, uh, is that right? 23? Well, around 26? Something Jump like from that. 17. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, obviously we're facing an enormous challenge and I'd like to ask Claudia first to give us something of an overview of the global situation before we dig down to more specific uh, examples. So, Claudia? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to be able to talk about this issue in general. And I think that if, if I could picture uh, the, what, what we see as the global movement is that there's going to be even more, like people are moving and they will continue moving and that will continue, uh, continue to grow be refugees, migrants, or a blur of that. So I think that what we need to take into consideration is that this issue will continue, people will move, and the boundaries probably, and the, 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 the denominations will be blurred. Just to give you a sense of perspective, what we're talking about, you mentioned, um, you mentioned the number of refugees, but refugees are only 8% of actually the total number of migrate, um, people migrating, and that means people that don't live in their own country. We're talking about 244 million uh, people around the world, that if you put it together just to have a sense of perspective, that would be the fifth largest country in the world, just about Indonesia, just like in terms of like Brazil, in terms of population, 51% of international migrants reside only in 10 destinations. So the number is going up. So we have, for example, that net immigration um, has increased from 128 to 148 countries, but the countries that are receiving has been reduced. So in the past, you have 102 countries receiving migrants, and now it's only 78. And actually, that number will continue shrinking because people are just going to some places, particularly cities. Um, overall, just wanted to say one more thing about like the global, um, the global, the global movement that I see. I see a lot. We see a lot of the population growth is going to have more than 2.4 billion people projected between 215 and 250. 1.3 billion people of those are going to be in Africa. And at the end of the day, you have a growing population that will actually be um, residing in, you know, like in, in countries that maybe they're not ready 
for that amount of people. So we will see probably even an increased number of people just because of the population growth independently of all the causes. So what I wanted to say is migration and the movement is inevitable, but it's positive. And I think that, it, well, it is positive, and I have a number of things to say about why we believe that migration is positive, and I truly believe that it, it's not the solution. The solution is actually just to invest in tackling the root causes why people move, because people would, wouldn't necessarily move from their own homes if they would have a chance to have safety, uh, safety environments, education, health, and all the basic rights that people have. Um, just in terms of the number of, I think that overall, if you see the numbers and you think about, do we have a framework, a global framework to actually talk about this? Who, who, what is migration? Is there, an international, uh, is there an international framework? So we can talk later about like the global compact for migration that tries to do three things, ensure that all countries around the world know that this is going to happen and how do we do a safe order and regulated migration for all. But Migration and refugees and people on the move have one side of the story, but I want to talk to you as a UNICEF representative of the human side of that, the humanitarian aspect of that, where you see more than 50 million children that have migrated in the past. 20 million of them actually have fled violence and conflict. And those are serious, there are serious gaps in the laws and the policies um, that, that are actually are regulating that. That means that children that are moving have no safe passages and they are most of the times victims to traffickers and people, abusers, taking advantage of them. So we have six points that we want to make sure at UNICEF that we brace in this framework of organizing the mental frame of what's migration and what is going to be the framework for refugees. We need actually uh, children to be able to be protected when they move because they will move. We need to ensure that they have education and access to health. Uh, we need children to be not jailed. Uh, 100,000 children were jailed in America coming from Mexico from 215 to 216. That's not fair. Children are children. They are, not being, they are not migrants or refugees. They are children and they are the future of our world. So we need to actually pay attention to, um, to, to the areas of humanitarian, the humanitarian causes of migration. I just want to fa finish one thing. There's a call I think that to action when it comes to wherever this distinguished audience, when it comes to thinking of the humanitarian aspect of, of migration, which is if you are thinking that these are human beings, these are not numbers that we're talking about. Everyone has a dream, everyone has a home and an aspect, you know, like an, and there's a reason, a desperate reason why they leave their homes to go somewhere else and look for hope. So if you're in a business environment, Try to actually consider refugees and migrants as potential assets of societies by training them, by giving them jobs. If you're, in a, poli if you're a policy maker, put children on your, in your policies, in your budgets, in your areas, because at the end of the day, this is an area that will continue happening. And the, the better way that we can do is actually just like consider that these are human beings that potentially can benefit societies. That's it. Well said, Cody. Thank you. While you were speaking and uh, your, uh, your emphasis on migration as a, a positive force in the world, I was just thinking all of the people on this panel are either the children of migrants or are migrants themselves. So uh, I'm a migrant to China. I live in China and have for the last 17 years. I consider myself a migrant worker in the Chinese sense. Uh, but the three of us are all uh, migrants ourselves, and both of you are the children of migrants Great. to another country. So I thought... Uh, I think that's interesting, and uh, we're all positive people, so I think uh, <laughs> I, I agree completely with what you said. So, <laughs> Akul, please, could you give us a bit of uh, a sense of, in the city-specific uh, case of your city that you were the mayor of until a couple of months ago, uh, some of the lessons that, that you've learned, some of the challenges that you've been dealing with? Thank you, Jamil. Uh, I think I better start first with the, the cities uh, and global cities are making history. And this takes me to a, a story with uh, His Majesty King Abdullah II of, of Jordan, who is a student of history and Sandhurst, so he's combined the military and, and uh, history as well. Uh, on a trip to Singapore, on a flight to Singapore, His Majesty and I were talking about, uh, you know, 
Toynbee, Arnold Toynbee, uh, defined uh, history as geography in motion. But what, what is Singapore all about with Link Kuan Yew and, and what happened there? It's becoming a, a, a big city and a state. And he says, you know what? If uh, uh, Toynbee was alive, it would probably redefine history as economies in motion because out of Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Amsterdam, New York, on a phone, you can, you can do a trillion uh, dollar deal and, and economies can, uh, no borders. Now, recently I brought that up with His Majesty with, with this flow of uh, refugees in my city and, and, and the country. I said, Your Majesty, what would uh, Toynbee define history now? He said, you know what? I probably would say it is a, a, a demographies in motion. It's migration. And this brings me to a, 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 a little paper I, I, I wrote uh, not very long ago where I say migration is a fundamental aspect of human existence. We all migrate for a variety of reasons. Some people move in search of new economic opportunities. Others move to escape armed conflict, poverty, food, insecurity, persecution, terrorism, or human rights violations and abuses. Still, others do so in response to the adverse effect of climate change, that's another thing now, natural disasters or other environmental factors. Many move indeed for a combination of these reasons. These migrations take us sometimes from city to another, sometimes we cross borders, and sometimes oceans. But when it comes to refugees, migrants and refugees, refugees is where you find yourself uh, abreast with a situation that, that you have to accept people in and they are totally dependent on you. The situation I, I once was in 1948 with the state of uh, Jordan and I became a Jordanian, but now with, with, with this uh, uh, waves of, of refugees that we receive from Syria, we have 1.4 million uh, Syrian refugees in, in Jordan over the past six years. That's about 30% of the population of, of Jordan. Just imagine if 30% uh, uh, th of, of uh, I don't want to say Mexicans, or, but cross their borders into the United States, what will, will, will happen? So we, we have to uh, uh, look deeply into uh, what refugees uh, uh, need, the, the needs that uh, Claudia is talking about. Uh, when I was taken in, uh, as a refugee, as a child, a family of 11, we found schooling, we found care, and, and we managed. We had UNRWA at the time to dish out food and, and the like, and uh, uh, have survived. I will uh, stop here and then come back and, and talk about the impact of, of such a presence uh, on my city and what it has uh, done and how we dealt with it. Jamil? Thank you, Arko. So, uh, Henry, the US is obviously not dealing with a uh, problem on the same or an issue on the same scale as uh, places in the Middle East are but immigration is obviously a huge issue in the recent election last year and uh, and today perhaps you can talk a little bit about the US experience um, particularly from the perspective of, of your city sure Jamil thank you um, the politics this the, the uh, tsunami effect of the politics in the United States has been as significant as other places even though the numbers may not be as big it was the issue, probably the dominant issue in the political campaign of 2016. Akhil and Claudia have done a good job of, of, of laying the context in the international environment. Uh, and I'd like to say just a brief word about that. Uh, they've described this as a, an era of movement. And my guess is that we'll see much more movement in mm -hmm. the years to come for reasons of displacement of people, uh, for insecurity issues such as in Syria but also things like climate change. Uh, most of the people who study climate change believe that whole agricultural reason, uh, regions are going to cease to be viable and people will have to move and we'll see massive movements within countries uh, from region to region as well as across uh, parts of, of continents. Um, so uh, then you add on top of that the, uh, the secular economic patterns that are wiping out, for example, agriculture as a lead producer in many countries because of technology, uh, because of difference uh, of crops, and, and people go to where they can find jobs, 
and th that's, that's in the cities. The new world economy is more city friendly. There are more jobs in the cities and people want to go there. The cities are not prepared in terms of housing, in terms of sanitation, water arrangements. We see places like Mexico with large satellite cities of a million people outside of Mexico City. Uh, China uh, has uh, 100 cities over a million population today. It's estimated that in 20 years, China will have 200 cities over a million people as the displacement of people from agriculture to try to find places in the cities. And the worst is yet to come for Africa, as you were mentioning. Um, it, Africa has been slow in urbanizing, but the same patterns that affect the rest of the world are about to occur in Africa. <coughs> So the story of the cities of the world is a study is a, is a, is a uh, story of in migration on a massive scale. In the United States, the numbers are not quite as stark. Although the Brookings Institution, where you once worked, now tells us that the United States is certainly an urban nation, a metropolitan nation, and uh, we're in some ways have become a bicoastal nation as a result with major centers like. San Francisco and Los Angeles anchoring Portland, Seattle, San Diego on the West Coast, and then Boston through uh, Philadelphia, New York, uh, Washington, and Florida in the East Coast. Um, but the, the most notable migration within the United States is people coming from around the world to work, but principally the nations to the South, with Mexico being the largest provider of people who come to work and then some smaller nations in Central America like Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador also sending people. And obviously they go to where the work is, so most have gone to the big cities bicoastally, as such as I've mentioned, but increasingly patterns are moving toward other places where there are opportunity in the heartland. So the Mexican diaspora into the United States is not just the traditional places where they have been and you would expect, but it is uh, Omaha and places in eastern Washington, Spokane, and in Oregon, and places in uh, Georgia and North Carolina and, and, and other places in the country. Um, and and, and it, it has altered the politics dramatically. Uh, some of it is fear um, as politicians exploit the change uh, and play to people's fears. But some of it is natural in small communities in the Midwest where Mexicans have gone to do agricultural work or do work in feedlots. Um, the, the, the language is different. The, the complexion of people is different. The uh, food that they enjoy and is advertised on the street is different. The, the, the churches change their hours so that people can have a Spanish mass on Sunday. Uh, and so there's cultural change in those communities. It's very uh, dramatic. Uh, let me just close by saying that the United States problem of migration is relatively fixable. We understand the model of immigration reform. We're just not able to do it politically. But it is essentially thought to be of three pieces. The first is some measure of border security because a sovereign nation needs to say, if you have a border, then you have to protect your border. And, and the process should be legal, you know, a, 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 a statutory process. The second piece is legalization of the 12 million undocumented people who are working in the United States today. Relatively easy to do, relatively straightforward. It's a matter of, uh, of, of helping people uh, define themselves, uh, pay some kind of a fine, maybe pay some back taxes, uh, but, but there's a way to legalize people and they're needed in the workplace. Without them, agriculture and other sectors would be in serious problems. The third, more difficult piece is uh, the path to citizenship. Uh, and some people call that amnesty. But the last time the Senate tried to do this, they had a very plausible, very logical plan that said, if you pay some back taxes, if you're here for a period of time, if you learn the language, if you play by the rules and stay within the law, over a period of time you can be a citizen. I think that three-part strategy is the way we will do this in the United States. And I'm hopeful that we can still get this done sometime in the next years because it's so obvious what needs to be done and leaving people in the shadows uh, living as second class citizens ought not be the American way.
Thank you, Henry. It's uh, very eloquent. Um, Khalid, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, the experience in Europe. We've been seeing, obviously, over the last uh, couple of years, a huge wave of, of migration, and it's caused serious problems in, in many parts of, of Europe. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, about that. Of course, thank you for the uh, <clears throat> invitation. I just, if I may, like to start with some perspective on the numbers that we've just uh, heard about, because I think there is a, a risk when we discuss migration that we use data to alarm people rather than inform people and feed a crisis narrative that's certainly alive in Europe uh, at the moment. Now, of course, Claudia's right that we have 244 million or so migrants. That's roughly the population of Indonesia, the fifth biggest state in the world, if it was a, a state. That's something like one in 33 people in the world today is an international migrant. But of course, another way to state that is that 3% of the world's population are international migrants and 97% are not. And I think the really interesting question is, given the forces that Henry has just spoken about, why more people are not migrating? And I think you're right, we're going to see more migration, for example, as a result of climate change. So a bit of perspective, 3% of the world's population are international migrants. For some reason, 97% aren't moving, and let's celebrate and understand that. Perspective uh, is important. But I think uh, Akal and Claudia have provided some really important perspective on the European context. And what has been desperately lacking in Europe over the last two or three years is perspective. At its peak, which was 2015, migration flows to Europe numbered about a million people. That is a million people in a continent of over 500 million people, and in a continent that, until the UK leaves, which we'll see what happens there, uh, is the wealthiest single market in the world. You cannot tell me that the wealthiest single market in the world with 500 million people cannot cope with a mere 1 million people arriving. It's quite clear to me that in Europe, the political significance of migration far, far outweighs its numerical significance. This needn't be a crisis. I don't think there's a crisis of numbers. I don't think there have been huge ways. There's not a crisis of numbers in Europe, but I think there are two other crises that we have to confront. One is a crisis of political leadership. Uh, and honestly, with the exception of Angela Merkel, who I think should have been given the Nobel Peace Prize for what she did in Germany, I know it was unpopular, but I think it was very brave. With the exception of Angela Merkel, and I think possibly with the exception of the Pope, I've seen no political leadership at all in Europe around migration. And I think that's lamentable. The second thing that I think there is a crisis around is a crisis of public confidence. If you went to any European country and you spoke to a random poll of 100 people and you said to them, do you think your government is in control of the borders? Do you think your government is in control of migration? I guarantee the majority would say no. Now, they're wrong. In fact, most governments in Europe are in control of migration. But here's a great example of how perception absolutely outweighs reality. So I think we have to be careful about perspective, understanding what the crisis really is in Europe. It's political leadership and it's public confidence. Where I think there is a genuine crisis of numbers, and of course it doesn't compare to Amman or the numbers we see in places like uh, Lebanon and Turkey as well, but where I think there has been a crisis is in certain cities uh, in Europe. And as we've already discussed, migration absolutely focuses on cities. Most migrants go to cities and we don't blame them for doing so. But a good example would be Malmo. Many of you will know Malmo. I think the second largest city in Sweden in the south. I was in Malmo in Christmas 2015, and in Malmo, during December 2015, 10,000 people a week were arriving. Now, this was a, a city that had run out of beds, hospital spaces, school places. I think on the coal face, on the front line of migration, in places like Malmo, in some of the municipalities that we have in Germany at the moment, clearly there is a, a challenge. And I think we shouldn't ignore that challenge. And I think we're going to come on to discuss how cities can respond and cope with that challenge. Thank you. Khalid. Um, it strikes me as uh, very interesting that this, what we're talking about when we talk about letting in refugees, when we're talking about large-scale migration, we're really talking about an issue that affects, as I think Claudia was pointing out, uh, a relatively small number of countries, and particularly affects Western, liberal, open democracies. I live in Asia, I live in China, and I can tell you it's not a problem in China because they just don't let anyone in. I mean, Japan is a great example. I think Japan last year took five refugees. Uh, in a country of 120 million or so. Um, so we're really talking about something that is uh, a problem of open liberal democracies. Um, which, which I might say mm. is a problem for those countries in the long run. I agree. Because Japan is one of the few nations in the world that is actually declining in Absolutely. population today mm. because they've been so hostile to immigration. To be Korean in Japan is to be a decidedly second class citizen. And Japan, is, is, its economy is changing, uh, it, its demographics is changing, its aging ratio of 
people who are, are, are need to be supported versus people who are working has dramatically changed. And we're going to see the same thing in other countries that have been hostile to immigration. Uh, uh, countries like Spain, for example, or, or uh, Germany until recently uh, have, uh, you know, really poor records of, 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 of handling immigrants. Um, if you believe, as Claudia has said, that immigrants are a good thing for countries, they bring youthful energies, they bring the ambition of the striver, they bring uh, a, a, a hope and, and, and energy to a country, then those who uh, really resist immigrants are on the wrong side of history. And Jamil, if I, sorry, if I could just comment on your, your opening statement there. I think we often forget that something like half of the world's migrants move between countries of the South. This isn't just a South-North flow. It's about movements within Africa, within Asia, between various countries in the so-called developing world. And we often forget about that and tend to over-focus on people from the South coming to the North. I think it's important to get that piece of perspective. The case of Jordan, we, uh, you know, we, uh, 1948, the flow of Palestinian refugees, uh, Amman, and uh, later on from uh, Iraq, and later on from Syria, now from Yemen and Libya and all, we're not uh, hostile to, to, to them. We, we had to. We found them uh, knocking on the door, no place to go. Otherwise, they will be left for persecution and for the misery uh, that they, they have uh, fled from. And, uh, but what do we do? Uh, what, the, the impact it has done to, to a city like Amman, 4,000 people in 1906, 40,000 in 1946, 4.4 million people as we speak. And 40% of the people of Amman, the capital of Jordan, are non-Jordanians. They're, they're, they're predominantly refugees and not immigrants. They have not applied to come in and work. They are there and working. So this has given us uh, uh, five issues to, to worry about. The environment is one. And I tell you about uh, the, the, the uh, waste management. Mm -hmm. Waste management is, is, sur is surmountable. We, the landfills that, that we, we've, we've built and, and the like. The infrastructure, the, the, the roads and infrastructure, the, urban mobility that we have to, 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 to face. Three, the, the zoning of the city. The, uh, you know, this was in the round table uh, discussion of mayors and, and, and Mayor uh, Emmanuel and uh, uh, Evo uh, discussed, uh, or talked about, about this, the, the zoning. What do you do when it's a, a high density and it disrupts the number four, which is the socioeconomic jobs that, that are taken by, by these people. And a lot of them come with, with, with uh, expertise and come with, with talent and uh, what, what happens to the, to the uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, hands. The, the fifth fear that we have is the identity, the identity of the city. Mm -hmm. You know, downtown in the square, you hear the uh, Syrian dialect, and in Syria there are five, six different dialects, and when you have 300 and 435,000 in, in, in the city, and uh, the Egyptian as, as working labor, the, the, the Yemenis, the Iraqis, and, and, and all, there is that fear of, of your identity, uh, and the, the diversity is great, I, I agree, and they bring talent as, as, as well. Our schools are 24, you know, uh, the, the hospital is 24 seven, but our schools run on two shifts to accommodate these, these refugees and vocational schools. So when they leave and when they go back, they find jobs to do. But Thank if you. I may, Jamil, I just can't, can't contain myself from actually praising the leadership and the boldness and the courage of Jordan over the years. When I was 10 years ago working for the UN Refugee Agency, no one cared about refugees, no one knew about it, and yet you were there for decades. Boarding. Now because of the Syrian crisis, Europe has started to sympathize and actually understand what it means to actually have so many people coming, and you have the desperate, you know, like if you're, if you're in policy or in politics or if you're in a city, you have a big issue 
should to deal with. How do you integrate? How do you actually cope with people that if you don't open the door are probably going to risk death? And nevertheless, Jordan has been there for a long time, opening the door for so many people, more than 30%. I think that Exodus, the book, said that if you have uh, more than 20% of foreign or alien people in your country, the social tissue of your society might be disrupted. You have more than 40% and yet have coped. So I command you for your efforts. Thank you so much. I wanted to say one more thing, which is probably more personal to um, what Henry has said, which is this country. I am a Mexican. I'm a woman, I'm a Jewish person that lives in this country for the last three years, and I've seen what America can do for, like for example, my children. They arrive with a word of English, they are so well integrated thanks to the opportunities they have. Not everyone had that opportunity, not everyone has the opportunity. We have to do a better job in integrating, but on behalf of the Hispanic community, of those 55 million people, 17% of the population of this country are Hispanics. There's more salsa sold than, than ketchup, and there's more tortillas sold than bread in this country, and yet we're not represented, not in the media, not in politics, not anywhere. But it is not about the representation only. It's about the lack of sight. It's so sh how short-sighted are we as a society in this country not to see the huge opportunity. Latinas create six times faster uh, small businesses than any other group in America, let alone other women groups. They create more jobs than any other group in this country, and yet we have not actually seen the opportunity to transform them. I want to congratulate Ram Emanuel for taking such a big stand for, you know, like for migrants here and make this city such a heaven for people like mine, like the Hispanics that actually feel uh, welcome. I am deciding, like I live in New York and one third of the time we're in Chicago because this is a place where I feel welcome and this is a place where I think that there's so much opportunities but altogether, no I do, I, I actually think that this is a city uh, that is an exemplar, ex, ex, exemplary city. But I do want to actually, I'll, I'll also ask Chicago and all the other cities in the world to start changing the perspective and look at Hispanics as a potential growth to activate the middle class of America. So stop calling us bad hombres. We are actually probably what can make America great again. <laughs> Jamil, can I just pick up on that very important word that we heard there, short-sightedness, and I think that's a real challenge in Europe at the moment. It's fairly clear to me, and I, I make no bones, and I'm clearly pro-migration and pro-asylum, but it's fairly clear to me that in cities in Europe, in the short term, migration can be a challenge. Integrating people, yes. educating them, finding hospitals, so on and so forth. In the long term, migration pays enormous dividends. Now, the problem in Europe is we don't have the institutional structures to be patient for the dividends, because we need to win our election next year. And in a year's time, the Syrians in Germany will add no value at all to Germany, it's absolutely clear. In 10 years' time, if we integrate them correctly, they will absolutely guarantee the preeminence of the German economy. If we get it wrong, that way lies disenfranchisement, violent extremism, all the rest of it. But we don't have the institutional structures to be patient to realise the dividends of migration at the moment. And that's, I think, a real challenge. And that's something I think cities can bring to the table. That's something the private sector can bring to the table. We just need to think more creatively about who should be around the table discussing these issues. This is a, a session on cities, and yeah. nowhere is the issue of cities in the United States more acute at the moment than on immigration because Absolutely. of this concept of sanctuary cities, yeah. mm -hmm. which cities like Chicago have been. Uh, and what, basically what it says when you look at it in the big picture is, here is a safe place. The federal government may be ambiguous, even hostile as to where it wants to be on these questions, but in cities there is protection. In cities there is places where people are respected for their heritage. Um, in Texas, we just had a legislature finish with very uh, anti-immigrant uh, and anti-sanctuary city measures. Uh, which would fine local officials if they pursue policies related to sanctuary and uh, even uh, punish police officers if they don't assist the immigration services. So it's, it's a very, very um, uh, hot and acute question that needs, uh, that's, that's going to, I mean, it, it relates to the city's theme that we're dealing with today. Also, I, I'm, I quickly with respect to Khalid's point about integration, one of the principal new functions of city governments going forward will be the integration Absolutely. of newcomers into cities. Already we're city, seeing cities that have departments of immigrant integration, 
officers in the mayor's office who are setting up programs to welcome immigrants because they know a fundamental kind of iron rule of the future, you're going to have immigrants. Mm -hmm. The question is, are you going to integrate them and find ways to do this creatively, or are they going to be contentious, separated, separatist, angry, and, 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 a, and a, uh, a, a, a real serious force in the future? Uh, there's no question we're going to have immigrants. Are we prepared to deal with the, the immigrant so I want to get integration into, questions? Great. I want to get into some specifics about how you actually do this integration. So we've said it's a good thing to integrate, but how? How do you do that? Um, because if we look at what's happened in just recent weeks in the UK with these attacks, these are not people yeah. who are recent immigrants. These are second, third generation often. Uh, children of immigrants or grandchildren of immigrants in some cases who are disenfranchised, who have not been integrated and have chosen to follow violent jihad against uh, their, their own countries. Um, so I wanted to ask maybe all of you, I mean, Aman, is a, as we said, is a great example of this. How do you, but, but I've heard from other people that uh, Lebanon and uh, Jordan have followed quite different uh, approaches to this. Um, maybe you could We'll start with you, but then we could all say, how do we do this integration? It's, uh, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it was fait accompli. They, they were just there. Either die on the other side or let them come in and live. Right. So, uh, not that we didn't have any choice. We had the humanitarian choice of letting them in. Whereas we are the third poorest country in water in the world. So we're sharing that water. Uh, uh, our, our, our bread and, and, and sugar is subsidized and, they, and electricity, and they are sh sharing that. Our national resiliency plan for 2017-2019 has called for $6.7 billion to, to, to support this. We've only managed to get 2.5 committed. Uh, we get 30%, 37% of what uh, uh, the, the refugees, it's again, it's a, it's a d different uh, 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 ball game altogether sure. than, than what we are hearing on this left-hand side. Probably there is some uh, uh, similarity in, in, in Europe. But nevertheless, because of the culture, because of the language, because of the religion, because of the cross-border relationship that existed before, maybe because at one point it was all one country under the Ottomans, so we, we had this the, 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 uh, uh, the mobility of, of, of uh, Bedouin tribes and, 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 and families and all have made it easier and made it uh, natural to the Jordanians to kind of some welcome uh, people in mm -hmm. and where the, the government is, is doing its utmost to accommodate them, as I said, in, in health, in education, and Claudia has alluded, alluded to, 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 to that. But we do have camps and in these camps, we fear that some uh, militancy uh, would, would, would come out and they would be the ones to go back and uh, we're not exporting terror. We have to control that. So just think of the security constraints that we uh, still have or the screening that we have to do for those coming in because a number of the terrorist attacks that took place within the city, within the country, Jordan, the people that came in along with the refugees crossing the border. To, to, to go to your specific point of, mm -hmm. of specific measures yeah. that we'll see around the world, housing, obviously, or cities and or people end up in shanty towns, in favelas, as in uh, uh, Brazil, for example, in large numbers, unsustainable. Uh, we see that in Africa. Um, ed, uh, literacy and language, uh, great disunifying force is diff different languages, so it's, language is important in this context, not to give up one's heritage, but to learn a language by which people can function. Obviously, uh, economic opportunities, important. Uh, uh, matters related to uh, municipal services, including health services, important. Uh, where those are not afforded on, an, on, a, on a fair basis, as in France, we see, again, these seed beds for contention and alienation. Uh, so these themes of immigration can be addressed. Some countries are doing it well. Maybe Israel is one of the better in terms of bringing people from Ethiopia and from Russia and, and other places wherever Jews are uh, threatened, they have a home in Israel. That's one of the reasons for the existence of Israel. 
and, and they do a very good job in terms of integration of people who come from around the world. It's a one model that's slightly contentious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he also created this fair number of uh, yeah, refugees. I lost my home in '48. <laughs> yeah. That's a sore point, maybe. Yeah, we'll, that, no, yeah. you're right. You're right. You're right. Maybe. Yeah. Could I just build on Henry's point? I mean, three quick points on integration, and I think you're right. This is the this is the challenge of migration: integration. It's all about the downstream challenges. Firstly, I think we need to be clear that integration is a two-way street. This is about rights and responsibilities. For too long, we've spoken about it's the city's responsibility, it's the government's responsibility. Migrants also have responsibilities. Mm. And I can speak as a British Muslim. You asked about some of the jihadis in the UK. I despair of some of the societies in the UK that have made no effort whatsoever to integrate themselves. I don't think it's unreasonable that if you come to my country, I should expect you to learn the language or to understand the basic laws and principles and values. I don't think that's an unreasonable racist, prejudiced statement. So it's a two-way street, and it's on migrants, I think, as much as the state. That's the first point I'd like to make. The second point, and this really reiterates, I think, what Henry's just said, I think we just need to move away from philosophies of integration and focus on the facts and, and what needs to be done. There are three broad philosophies on, on integration. Multiculturalism, which is the Western European notion, which is you can live together in a patchwork of, of wonderful, diverse societies. There's, I suppose, assimilation, which is a French model, which is you don't have dual nationality, you can't wear your headscarf, you have to behave and believe in the French ways and values and so on and so forth. And I suppose the third model is the American model, which is largely the sink or swim model, right? If you come here and work hard, you can make it to the very top. If you don't, it's quite difficult, I think, to survive sometimes. as the, the, the although, although one element of the American model that's essential to it is a belief in immigration. Absolutely. The narrative yep. here is we're a country of immigrants. Which is why more migrants come to the US than any other country in the world still, because it's the land of opportunity. And I think most migrants understand that. I think we just need to move away from those philosophies and focus on the housing, the education, the jobs. If you give migrants a chance, they've shown that they will succeed. I think that's very clear. We, we just need to really focus on, on those issues. And nevertheless, there is an increase. I mean, like, if, if I may. I Yes, 1,000%. Who couldn't disagree? Who couldn't, you know, like just not 100% agree with what Henry says altogether? But like in this case, but it, racism, uh, the divisive language, xenophobia, discrimination, the difference between you and I, my color, my identity, the affinity groups. People are increasingly actually leading, leaving globalization to becoming more national, to becoming more tribal. And that's something that we have to address. And we have to understand that people are upset and they are at risk. And even if you ask someone rationally, like speaking to the mind of someone, 63% of Americans would say immigration is good. But if you actually go to the emotional side of that equation, it's like I'm scared that someone is going to take my job, I'm scared that I'm going to lose my culture, my identity, my fear, and that's why I think that overall, if I could devote my time, you know, like an effort over the next five years, is to tackle the issue of perception and of diversity and discrimination, because I think that those are fundamental issues that will never allow us to integrate if we continue thinking that we're not all humans. But in, in, the, um, in, in the other aspect, I think that uh, you were talking, uh, this panel is quite aligned, isn't it? We're all like hurrah hurrah for the migration and the refugees. <laughs> I'm trying and, to be devil's advocate a little bit, but it's, not, but it's quite hard because I don't It's not easy. It, so. For all of you, I see a number of people in the panel that are in politics. Do you have to actually deal with your taxpayers? You have to deal with your voters. And people actually are going to, you know, like disagree fundamentally with what this panel is saying. And that's why I think that having something that regulates, that gives you a framework of how do you actually make sure that you allow the people that that you're not not human, humanitarian, that you're doing the right thing, but at the same time is not going to allow, you know, like this. So I think that that's why having something like the Global Compact for Migration is going to be necessary in order to allow an agreement among, among nations about what are the rules and how are we going to implement. Uh, at this time of, the, like of, of our history, I, I, it's almost impossible to believe that we don't have such an agreement. Can I just ask all of you, and it's uh, in some places in the UK, for example, they're looking, and the US, so they're looking to places like Australia uh, and New Zealand, where I grew up, uh, uh, which have a point system. So we're, we're blurring a little bit refugees, migrants. We're talking more about uh, the choice. We, I mean, um, uh, Jordan didn't really have a choice. You had people on the doorstep. But when you do have a choice, when people are coming from across the sea, from a long way away, 
Um, what, are, what are the pros and cons of this point system? So under the system, you, you want to go live in Australia. You have to have a certain level of education. You have to have a prove a certain level of English ability. You have to uh, make certain promises about, you know, no criminal record. There's a whole series of things. It's quite onerous and uh, quite difficult. Um, but it seems that by introducing this point system, you guarantee a better chance of integration. I mean, it's a major contention point in the United yes, States. I know. Because the engineers in Silicon Valley want PhD educated Indians and they would admit them, right? But not poor people coming from the South. On the other hand, there's poor people coming from the South who've been here for a generation and haven't seen their families and want to reunify with families. So do you give more points to family re reunification, as we have traditionally, or more to economic and educational standards? So the point system doesn't cure the problem. You still have the hard issues. Like everything else, it's a balance. And whatever we emerge with will be a balance. The present administration is stressing the economic points on the system uh, because uh, you know, they, they th it'll be easier to admit people who are instantly going to be able to go to work. Uh, in high technology uh, fields. So it, it, it is a major point of contention. You raise a good issue. There's no easy answer. Yeah, but uh, uh, Claudia mentioned uh, something very important. Look at Britain now with the Brexit yeah. uh, moving away from, from, from Europe. And uh, you folks here in, in the United States uh, with the travel ban and, and, and all that thing, mm -hmm. again, you're moving out like the modern doctrine, you know, the, the, back in the 18th century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what is happening here? Well, the, nearly the right wing nearly made it in, in France. Mm -hmm. And uh, had they, had they uh, won, uh, they would have again shifted to something like the, 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 the British move. Mm -hmm. well, I think the, cons the sense in the United States is that many working class white Americans have seen the economy move away from them, less opportunity, Industries like coal, for example, in, the, in, the, in Ohio and Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And, and there's real anger out there, which, yeah. as Claudia said earlier, is pointed at the immigrants. And in Europe, in the UK. And the UK, the whether it's valid or not. Uh, so uh, clearly we have to do things to, to deal with real people who are suffering real things, like the loss of industry and the loss of jobs. I mean, that is a major oversight that maybe in our focus on, on, on kind of minority rights, we'd gone one degree too far and left people out uh, who, who felt like, we're Americans, what about us? And now they have a, a, a reason to be angry. And, and you understand, right? Like 70% sure. of the world will live in cities. Um, and if I am living in a city and I think the issue of migration coming with population growth and automatization, and maybe a robot actually, not only a migrant, but a robot might take my job. And like you start looking at a perception of what's the future look like and how are we going to ensure that, you know, like my citizens and my, my voters and my taxpayers are able to follow. But again... And there's also the issue, Claudia, of cities versus rural areas, right. because yeah. the elites live in the cities and, and, we, and there's solutions in the cities, but places like West Virginia, very tough. And Jamil, if I could turn the tables on you, since you represent the media, I have to, and of course you represent a very good newspaper, but I have to say, I have very to say, good. of course, I have to say in the European context, the media is part of this problem. I mean, there's a crisis narrative, there's an anti-immigration challenge, and the media... Yeah. Who's clever? <laughs> The media, whatever that means these days, is the just yeah. not being responsible at all in Europe. Not the financial time. I agree, and, 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 and just like to emphasize a little bit like that, but I think that in this issue, you should probably consider doing a little bit more of the human face, as in like just making sure that this issue is representing the fears and the anxieties of everyone. The, one, the, the persons that are, you know, like overall feeling like, what do I do with migration, the politicians, but also um, the people that are, uh, that are moving, the, the children that are, imagine what, you've, what you need to be feeling to tell your child, I have nothing to give you. It's better for you to risk your life knowing that you're going to probably 50% make it or not make it alive to the next destination. Imagine what a mother must be feeling to let a child go and find another, another hope in another But this uh, is not an easy problem. Place. And having been a politician, a mayor, and having to represent a broad cross-section of people, there are people with grievances Absolutely. against immigration, which are real. And people in England yeah. right now, after, after those attacks of recent weeks, 
that you could understand why they would be yeah. angry and, 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 and going in the opposite direction of closing off. So the, the point is, these are not easy problems, but they're not going away. Mm. And at a session like this on cities, we're gonna to have to be attentive to this for the long haul. It, it is not an option to disregard this question. I'd like to bring a question in from the, uh, from the audience, uh, or from our audience maybe at home. Uh, what can global cities do to address the migrant crisis that states cannot do? I think that's a, a, to bring it back to cities. What is something that, and Henry, you're almost a perfect person to, uh, and uh, Akko, you've both served at the national and at the, uh, and at the local level. Uh, I'll just say very quickly because I've, I've said too much, but um, cities right now, I believe there's an urban renaissance, not just in the United States, but in the world. We're moving to a world economy that's centered on, the, on, on, on cities. And so they're the places that are gonna have some resources, some jobs, uh, new jobs in new fields. Um, cities can take the lead uh, on this question, which states really don't have much incentive to do. And we have seen, I mean, like from my world, we have seen some examples about some of the basics, I think, that go into Halet's points, about like the concrete things. For example, um, even in New York, New York City has started giving IDs to, the, to people, whether you have, you know, like whether you are documented or not. And that provides an identity to someone that allows them to have the right to go to a hospital and pay for the hospital, but also, you know, like to be able to exist and be able to be, so I think that the New York, uh, the New York City ID, New Mexico's driver's license, in Lebanon, in Uganda, there's a number of other areas in which people have been, you know, like um, able, cities have been able to deal with an issue that benefits them, but at the same time is dealing with, is, is dealing with, 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 the, with the people coming. In our situation, we're trying to uh, settle the area, you know, uh, be a, a, playing, a strong playing partner in, in peace, bringing peace, so these people can cross back to their, to their uh, country, to, to their towns and, and, and villages. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a, 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 a mission and a, and a vision of, of uh, the country of Jordan, is to help uh, out, bring peace in the area, and be a major player in that. And I think uh, the United Nations and all other major uh, uh, countries can witness and can uh, uh, verify that this is the role of Jordan. Because again, it's a refugee situation. It's not migrants and immigrants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd just like to uh, go back to your point about the media and then defend <laughs> all, of my, uh, all of my colleagues um, and say that it's too easy, I think, often to, to say, oh, it's the media's fault. And uh, um, how, can, how can politicians uh, in particular, particularly uh, mayors, uh, leaders of cities, how can you potentially do a better job of engaging the media so that you get uh, this issue um, higher up on the agenda? It's not about being higher up on the agenda, it's about doing it the right way. Mm. And again, I'm talking about some fairly toxic press in, in Europe, and of course not the Financial Times, but mm. it is quite clear that a lot of press in Europe pushes the negative stories. You know, a, a, a asylum seeker rapes someone, gets the headlines, the British national health system depends on migrants doesn't get the headlines. I mean, there's just the basic imbalance in terms of the way we, that we cover migration in many parts of Europe at the moment. I think it's just wrong. There are very simple answers. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful, going back to your point about the human face, Claudia, wouldn't it be wonderful to give 50 Syrian refugees an internship on the news floor so that they can see how it works and that you journalists can see how they work? Just some basic exposure. I think there's some really simple wins that we can be working towards, but it doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. Mm. We've got about... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to make a but promise like that. <laughs> I don't take 50 interns from anywhere. But, uh, um, put me on the spot. Uh, we've got about a minute left. Is there anything that any of you would like to emphasize? Uh, anything you'd like to, uh, to say at the end? I, quickly, I'd like to just make one point that I think is, is important. I think you made the point, Claudia, that we're, we're amongst the converted, probably in this room and here. I think the, the biggest challenge that I see in Europe and perhaps globally is that we are losing the space for a sensible, objective debate on migration. This debate's become increasingly polarized. You're either at this end of the spectrum and you think all migrants are heroes and victims and we have to admit them and we have to integrate them, or you're at this end of the spectrum and you think they're all coming to take our jobs and potential terrorists and so on and so forth. And of course, the truth is somewhere in between. 
And I think we have to have the space, and I think this, this forum is providing the space, to have that sensible debate. Sometimes migration is a challenge. Often it, it's a be benefit. Some migrants do come to take advantage of the welfare system. Most come to work hard. And I think we've just got to have a, a serious, sometimes unpalatable discussion about the benefits, but also the cost of migration. And if we lose that space, don't be surprised that the media and policymakers and politicians aren't having a sensible discussion. 20 seconds. <laughs> um, don't go for foreign aid. Like, fix the pro like the best solution for migration and people moving is to be well at home and tackle the root causes. So don't allow your countries to cut foreign aid and continue actually helping states uh, and, uh, and migrants and refugees go back home. This is going to be long, hard, never ending, and it requires faith in humanity, uh, which is an essential piece of how we live together as people. That's great. Mayors must build in uh, great resiliency in their cities to accept the unexpected. Lovely. Thank you so much, all of you. Yeah,